Hello and a very, very warm welcome to another edition of Business Unknown, made just for you by Brightrock on what is another bitterly cold day in Johannesburg, hence me inside and still in a jacket. But I'm about to be warmed up both by some fabulous food and some sparkling company because my guest this week is someone I've been looking forward to chatting to for some time. We've had some great guests on Business Unknown thus far with some great insight. Uh, the likes of Michael Yordan, of Ravi Naidu, Francois Pina have all come and joined us. We've shared a meal, we've shared some conversation, and we've got some insight from some great leaders on how they've navigated the last little stretch and what they see on our collective horizon. Today is somebody whose insight gives us a, a new dimension because long overdue, you. We have our first woman on the show uh, and definitely our most accomplished guest so far. And I say that because I did a dry run earlier today trying to run through her CV by way of introduction and it took me 22 minutes. So I thought, well, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'll start off instead by saying a very warm welcome to Sonia de Brain and, and asking you, Sonia, very simply, uh, dinner parties, which I think we both vaguely remember, things we <laughs> used to go to a very long time ago. When you meet somebody for the very first time, how does Sonia de Brain introduce herself and, uh, and and what do you say that you do for a living? Okay, um, thanks, Dan, for such a warm welcome. Um, I'm enjoying uh, the food that is around me. I haven't had such a sumptuous breakfast in a long while. And thanks for all the trouble that you and your team have gone to for arranging this morning. Um, in terms of introducing myself, um, I'll, I'll give you two examples. If I'm filling out those forms that you, you fill out when you land in a foreign country and they ask occupation, I'll say investment manager. <laughs> That's the most straightforward. Um, uh, but if it is a longer conversation, then I will describe that um, I'm part of a team that runs a women-led investment company that is based here in Johannesburg. Um, and then I also have some outside responsibilities, which are mainly non-executive directors ships um, on boards and a couple of chairmanships um, uh, also involving financial services and private equity. And I asked you to do that for a very specific reason, because you've got such an interesting portfolio of stuff that you do, uh, and it speaks directly to a lot of the questions that I think come up in this sort of engagement. People are uh, looking at the business world, looking at the economy, and a lot of them are really, really worried and genuinely so. And a, a little later in our conversation, we'll get you to solve all of those problems for us, which I'm sure you'll be able to do. Uh, but right now, uh, just looking back at this last stretch, these last five or six months, they've been really difficult times for everybody, but there have also been a few silver linings. Uh, can you give us a sense of the, the challenges that you faced both personally and within your business environment, but also maybe there have been one or two spots of sunshine over the last stretch? So Dan, I would say in terms of our own business, my day-to-day -day business, we're very fortunate that being a services business, uh, we don't need to be physically in a particular place such as on a factory floor or on a manufacturing plant. So trans transitioning to working from home was pretty straightforward. And in actual fact, we started to do that a few days before the 27th of March when official lockdown started. And, and that was relatively seamless. So I'm, I'm very grateful to for, for ourselves to have been able to be in that position and also that we all have sort of decent connectivity at home and enough uh, spaciousness that we don't feel so claustrophobic, which obviously is not the case with the majority of South Africans, who, you know, who don't have um, similar uh, uh, facilities in their immediate home environment. Um, and so I think with that gratitude also came um, an awareness of how much time is spent um, or and lost the leakage of spending time in traffic and, you know, sort of rushing in between meetings and stuff. So there's also an efficiency that comes into it. And you think of, you know, how much time you spend at airports and uh, getting to meetings in other towns or cities. So I think also grateful for that awareness of um, more efficiency and probably higher productivity. Obviously, there's a discipline on the other end in terms of, you know, actually uh, being able to end your day or switch off from work. And I think for many people, especially that first um, Easter, there were a couple of public holidays, if you remember, the April 27th and uh, the, the June 16th. I think some teams, especially in banking, with some of the 
liquidity crisis that their clients are facing. I know that, that, uh, particularly at that time in the early days of the lockdown, people felt that they weren't able to switch off. They were in constant meetings. They were dealing with crises and those long weekends or usual breaks that we take uh, uh, just, just vanished. Um, from the point of view of challenges that I've seen with the businesses that we're involved in, probably the biggest challenge was on a, a rail manufacturing plant where, as you know, in, lock, in lockdown five, literally everything had to stop. And in such a, a, a manufacturing plant, there's a tag time and there's a rhythm to how they work. And so having to pause that was quite challenging and to, to, to slow it down and shut it down safely and then to be able to restart safely again. I imagine in the mining industry, um, you know, those were similar challenges. And then to keep it on care and maintenance also um, sort of, you know, essential services uh, in a safe manner. That is probably the extreme of a, a situation where we had to sort of guide and, 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 and be quite close to a situation with, with a management team. On the other hand, I've also seen, uh, for example, from my involvement with Ethos Private Equity, how literally you testing times really do bring uh, capabilities and um, um, excellence in teams to the fore because you know the responsiveness the reporting um, the monitoring and the support that uh, uh, that team was giving to the various portfolio companies um, was incredible and then in actual fact reporting back to investors because investors were also interested to know how you know portfolio was coping investors then are also able to see the difference between various fund managers and 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 their capabilities come to the fore so that was um, very enlightening and I hope it was confidence building for the teams involved going forward in terms of investment, if you had put all of your money in March into Zoom, uh, you'd now be able to head off and buy <laughs> Belgium. Uh, if you'd put all your money into airlines, uh, you wouldn't be quite so happy. Yes. Uh, that juggle, uh, how difficult, how exciting, how challenging has that been as part of what you and your team do? Yes. So I think, you know, in these uncertain times, um, although there is a lot, a lot a higher level of contact. So, for example, you know, more frequent board meetings or board meetings being called at short notice. Um, that I think was more from a from an analysis and understanding what's going on point of view, and also any support or, or measures um, that needed to be put in place. I don't think in, during such times uh, people are making big calls on new investment positions or changes in investment positions, unless it's to manage the downside, obviously. It's probably more of preserve and protective measures as opposed to making new bold moves. And as you know, um, the variability in forecasting and uh, the difficulty of being able to budget at a time like this to actually put um, um, firm numbers in, in your forecast is going to be very difficult. So I think also from a forward-looking point of view, people are not, um, you, you know, they're not going to make risky calls in that fashion. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult time. It's, it's treacherous waters within which to have to make um, such investment decisions. And on the listed side, I mean, uh, you talked about Zoom and obviously there was a huge increase in, in their share price. On the listed side, um, how those asset managers make their calls. I've got a lot of admiration for them. <laughs> We've seen the markets have been all over the place. <laughs> I, I suspect you're probably very tired of friends and family WhatsApping you to ask what they should be investing in at the moment. So I won't ask you that question. I will, though, draw from two things you've mentioned already, one being the increase in frequency of board meetings and the other yes. talking about losing our sense of the end of a day. What have you done to define your business life to make sure that uh, you are, you're no longer working the entire time, that you do have a, a cutoff of sorts? You know, it's quite interesting. I think at the beginning, the first couple of weeks of lockdown settling in, I found myself working in, in different parts of my home and obviously depending on Wi-Fi quality, etc. Um, and then it sort of got into a Routine with winter, I found a place here on the patio. There's sunshine during the day. It's nice and warm. And so this has started to feel like an office. And it is quite interesting. I literally 
pick up my things from uh, uh, upstairs um, when I'm starting work for the day, put, uh, put on my handbag, <laughs> put on my shoes and walk downstairs as if I'm coming to my office. Um, and it feels like I'm starting my day. And obviously there's a few uh, short breaks here and there in between. And then at the end of the day, yeah, sort of winding down is probably the same with all of you know, every, everybody else, including yourself, you sort of take care of a bit of admin towards the end of the day, those last few emails, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it's been called put, put on the heat to have, you know, a cup of tea and so forth. And then uh, towards dinner time, seven or eight o'clock, literally switch off the lights here on the patches if I'm closing the office and, and go to other area in the house. So that's, that routine has really, has really, really helped me and to get myself into the right frame of mind. Oh, it, is, it is an important one. I heard somebody the other day say they no longer work from home, they just sleep at the office, and <laughs> I think it's a, a good way of putting it. Uh, it's also a good time for a break, I think, because we are not just the two of us. We also have for company some splendid food, and in particular some gnocchi, which I think you've probably yes. just got out the oven as well, um, yes. which has been uh, cooking nicely, a nice cheese coating. Mm. And, uh, uh, mm. This is splendid. Uh, it's got a, a lovely little cheese and crunchy topping to it. And how, how important is food for Sonia? You mentioned the end of the day you get dinner ready. Are you in the kitchen yourself? Is that a particular passion? So that's actually been one of the one of the treasures um, I've discovered during lockdown. I'm sure yourself and, and many friends and family members, you know, everyone was talking about what was their what was their lockdown skill going to be or you know, people have ambitions of writing a book or um, using all of the extra time to do something they've always been wanting to do. So I, I generally enjoy cooking. I'm not sure I'm very good at it. Um, and, you know, usually it's been for family occasions or, or entertainment. Um, and for myself, it's been much more sort of just functionary. But with having to cook, remember in lockdown five, uh, there weren't many deliveries, etc. I really, really enjoyed exercising that muscle, um, building my confidence in the kitchen. Um, I once did a course at the Prulita Cooking School in London as a reward to myself. <laughs> so I pulled out, pulled out some of those recipes <laughs> and used some of her, the utensils that they gave us there, the, the knives and stuff. So I really enjoyed that, that aspect of, of the lockdown and I think I'll be much more confident in future. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're a far better chef than you're letting on. Uh, how much is understanding how things work in London or in Tokyo or in other parts of the world both benefited what you do now, but also given you an appreciation for South Africa, both in business and just as a country? Part of that, the lens I can give is working in London, as you know, where there are a lot of South African, South Africans, some are expats. Some are, you know, on short, short-term short assignments, some are contractors. So they're in different roles and categories. But I always feel so proud here. We punch above our weight in every market that I've been in. And it's obviously only the visible figures to the media, et cetera. It's in, it's in every layer of the law firms, the investment banking firms. And I think obviously from a, from a developmental point of view, um, an awareness that we really, we, we have a dichotomy and there's um, a, 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 a paradox in terms of how developed we are in some aspects. And yet there's so much of our country and our society, which is still living in an underdeveloped uh, um, nation. Um, and the challenge for all of us, I suppose, the, 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 the work that we do that needs to be before us is to really um, uplift and to overcome uh, the barriers that uh, um, prevent people from uh, actualizing and developing their, their full selves and their full talents because of the conditions that they're in. So relative to other African countries, yes, we are more developed, but, you know, that's, that, that shouldn't be our standard. There's no doubting the quality of people we produce. We've got outstanding examples everywhere. How do we translate that to back home? How do we make sure that the same is happening here and that we're able to try and, and uplift the people you speak of who we see every day at a traffic light or outside a supermarket yeah. who just don't have that same, uh, that same sense of the country we live in? 
Yes, yes. So, Dan, I think all of us would say education is key, right? And one of the things that has been pleasing about the new administration in our government, well, maybe not so new now, a couple of years, is that I think on a few occasions I've heard the president speak about early childhood development. So, in other words, you know, the foundational aspects. I mean, you mentioned having a four-year-old and a six-year-old and Kaylee also has young children. And, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sure as, as active parents, you see a huge difference in how important those foundational aspects are. Um, uh, but we obviously don't have that in other communities. And then uh, obviously the rest of the, the strength of the educational system. Um, and also, I think, Coming, coming with that, um, probably the well-being in the life of a child. So, you know, poverty means that there are many other threats that come into people's lives. And we know gender-based violence is, is one of those, and it's too prevalent in South Africa. But in terms of one's well-being, to be able to, to manifest and grow and recognize their talents, recognize their innate skills, and recognize uh, what they bring to the world, the, the, the broader environment, not only what they learn in class or in school, is is, is important, and and that we really need to, we really need to focus on having healthier lives for people. In in terms of being a parent, my view is very much that I need to do what I can to make the world that my children grow up in a slightly better one, and that casts me uh, as a role model for them. And I want to get onto role models in just a moment, uh, but of far more importance than role models is beautiful mozzarella done in a light basil pesto, which is exactly what we have here. And I'd be dying to try this. this. It's fantastic, doesn't it? Look at it. It's the kind of thing that my wife would not let me eat because it looks far too rich. I do enjoy enjoy, um, a good caprese from time to time. That is lovely. Mm. Uh, Sonia mentioned role models just before we had that mozzarella break and splendid mozzarella it is unsurprisingly. Uh, You sit as a role model in many different spaces. You are incredibly successful in the business world and in an ideal world that is where your role model status would end because we wouldn't need to worry about the fact that you're also a black woman in business but those spaces are so important because you are you're not the norm particularly in South Africa and sadly although I think there is some change coming there's a long way to go and it needs to be accelerated how how conscious are you of being where you are as who you are and and how does it dictate uh, what you do and, and how you try and pass on the knowledge and the experience that you have i suppose with age and maturity then one becomes more and more aware increasingly aware um about uh, the importance i think you know initially perhaps one t- one took for granted or you take for granted that you're there for your your skills, your contribution, you know, e- e- everything else that, that everybody else is there for. And then you start to realize, especially maybe with younger people in the organization, you're in the lift with them, um, they ask you certain questions or you meet them in a, outside of a work environment in a social setting or at an event and they've noted where you know what you've done or where you are like strangers would refer to things that you wouldn't expect them to know about you and then you start you do start to realize that okay one needs to be sort of conscientious about um, younger people needing that or being curious about that um, I'm, I'm also grateful for other women that have served that uh, role for me I remember when I when I first started working, um, and my parents asked me who my role models were. For me, they were they were Jill Marcus, it was Maria Ramos, it was Cheryl Corollas, um, and and uh, the, there were forerunners, you know, in in the industry. So, in terms of how you utilize those platforms and demonstrate what is important or or directionally what people should be thinking about. I'm often keen to either be in a remuneration committee, subcommittee of the board, or, you know, to ask REM related questions, particularly with regards to whether or not those companies have made sure that there is fair pay for women. And that in terms of either the categories or the levels in the organization, that they're absolutely clear 
that women are not being paid less for men for the same kind of job or role, et cetera. That's one example. You know, there could be other examples of how when one is on the, those platforms, it, there can be a stretch beyond sort of uh, the, 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 the obvious um, technical or content uh, um, capabilities that are expected of, of all of us. I consider myself very fortunate to come from a family of extremely strong women. My wife is a, a very successful lawyer. As a result, I've yet to win an argument since we were married, and I don't <laughs> see that changing at all. Uh, and I'm reminded, as we, we speak on this particular topic, uh, your colleague at Remgro, a good friend of mine, Johan Rupert, posting mm -hmm. on social media a little while ago, a comparison between female world leaders and the success mm -hmm. they've had in dealing with the pandemic versus the men who haven't done quite so well by and large and it's just another example of the success of female leadership and uh, you often shake your head and think well yeah how not, how are more people not seeing this do you feel in south africa at a corporate level we are in a space or reaching a space where female leadership is acknowledged rather than okay well we need to have a woman on our board so it looks yes. good uh, that yes. people actually they're understanding just how much power influence contribution women are able to make I often say, I think in South Africa we were fortunate because with uh, overcoming apartheid and moving into, um, you know, a new new democracy, democratic era, we obviously embraced a lot of um, transformational aspects, which included the economy and, you know, wanting to, our society to, to, to live and behave differently. And some of that came with legislative um, requirements which all companies had to adhere to, which includes, you know, the empowerment codes and embedded in those uh, uh, codes of good practice was um, a delineation of, for example, gender equity and uh, giving um, additional incentives for youth involvement, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we were fortunate that already sort of in the early 2000s, uh, gender equality was uh, embedded in um, our ambition for how we wanted our society to be better balanced in the future. Whereas I think in other economies, as you know, corporations around the world are grappling with the question of diversity and inclusion. Um, and it seems that that conversation is only sort of heightening um, 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 maybe more passive activities uh, promote that uh, currently now. Um, and so I think South Africa is somewhat ahead of the curve. And I think also in some of those other markets, there's a more voluntary aspect towards it. You know, there's, there's, there's been some big wins um, in terms of, for example, women parliamentarians, you were talking about women in the political space um, in other economies. I mean, Angela Merkel was an early example of, of a, a strong woman leader who also in her economy wanted to put um, such measures in place. Uh, I, I think the private sector probably has more work to do um, in all economies. It feels as though the public sector has played its part and the, the, the private sector now needs to follow. I do get the sense that this is one of the conversations that is being had more. And for me, one of the benefits of this time of lockdown, South Africa and also more broadly, has been a lot of reflection and questions that have needed to be debated, like Black Lives Matter, like gender-based violence here, are seeing more time. And there is a lot, of, a lot of difficult questions being asked and to a point being answered. If I can ask you, Sonia, to pick what for you, you would say is your greatest triumph as Sonia, the business person, and then also your greatest failure, which is the space mm -hmm. where both as people and as others, we often do learn so much from. So it's hard, it's hard to think of oneself in those terms. Your words are very kind. Um, I often, I, I, I don't feel that um, I am where I need to be yet in terms of uh, career success and so forth. Um, from a triumph point of view, if I could put if I could basket a few uh, opportunities manifested while I was at the Women's Development Bank Investment Holdings, WDB Investment Holdings, um, to me, those, those felt like important milestones because for the first time you had women investors going into critical assets such as banking assets, 
um, and mining assets, uh, taking women into spaces where traditionally you don't find them. And um, having done served my time there and, and started our own business, I, I, I continue to believe in that philosophy and wanted to carry it forward. And probably the more recent triumph, if you'd like to call it that, is in 2018, there's a project that we're involved in. It's called Mela. It is a rail manufacturing company. It is the only um, uh, uh, manufacturing company that is currently producing trains on the African continent. And it is one of the more modern plants because it's been recently built. It was opened, as I said, in 2018. So in terms of challenges, uh, I would say probably one or two investments that haven't gone as well as we would have liked. Um, and the making sure that the learnings from that um, are applied and that we carry those forward into other conversations that we have, some of the things that we overlooked that we should have done better. It's a very honest reflection. I'm sure we'll get the same looking forward, which uh, I'll ask you to do in just a moment as we wrap up what's been a fabulous conversation with you, Sonia. You. Before we do that, though, there's a rather alluring bowl of dessert, which I'm quite keen to try, yes. and I suspect yes. you might be as well. Un peu de cremant. It does. Uh, just sort of a bowl of chocolate loveliness, isn't it? Mm, so. Yes. Mm. There, um, dessert for me often sits in a, a similar mind space as champagne, cup classique. Yeah. We eat, we drink by way of celebration when we're having a you know, birthday cake, or you know, that's where, where I think of dessert. And when I think of celebration, I, I think of all that I'd like to celebrate in South Africa. I'd like to, yes. in five years' time, have a country that's back on its feet, where the economy is thriving, where people are not going hungry. And uh, a lot of it is being you know, very utopian, uh, but I, I think that way nonetheless. I'm a natural optimist. Before I ask you just how optimistic you are about South Africa, and I'm, I'm yes. hoping for a, a fairly positive answer, uh, talk us through the future. You mentioned a moment ago that you still don't see you, uh, you at the, the end of your story. Uh, where does that story go from here? What chapters still have to be written? From a, from a personal, personal um, um, being more balanced point of view, I know that grammar is probably not correct. I would like, especially in that during this COVID time, I've had time to reflect. I would like to rebalance, if you like, my portfolio of interests the way that you described it at the beginning. Um, I like that analogy was probably to rebalance a bit more and have more time for healthy family life, um, give myself a chance to, to focus on that. Also, maybe some activities which are non-profit related, um, maybe uh, not necessarily philanthropic, but um, making a contribution to communities in, in important areas. Some of the things that we've talked about today, I'd like to maybe make some time for that, which may mean relinquishing some other things, but we're realizing in a post-COVID world um, that the way our society has been has has been evolving is, is is leaves a lot to be desired in certain areas, and we all need to find ways of contributing to making it better. Um, later in life, Dan, sometimes I get asked this question about whether or not I would ever want to go into politics or government. I think later in life, post-retirement, if I could add a contribution as a public servant, not as a politician, <laughs> you know, you have to have a different skin to, to be in politics, but maybe supporting the right um, um, influencer or supporting the right leadership um, as, a, as a technical um, support around uh, in, and in the right team, maybe much later in life, I, I would enjoy that type of opportunity. So dashing the hopes of President De Bruyne, sadly, but maybe the, <laughs> the quiet power behind the throne. <laughs> oh, no. Um, I'm sure we could have a whole other hours conversation about, about politics. <laughs> Uh, we certainly could. We won't go down that particular rabbit hole. Uh, what I will ask you, though, in, in closing, I, I love South Africa, and I find that those of us who've travelled have been fortunate enough to live in other countries, to spend a lot of time abroad, 
have a slightly different appreciation for South Africa because we know that the grass is not necessarily quite as green as it might look on television in other places. For you, what keeps you optimistic about South Africa? Uh, what do you believe in in terms of our future? Yes. And, and what can be done? What, in a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense, what difference can be made in the next few years that's going to guarantee the future that, that we're all hoping for? Yes. Look, we we both spoke earlier about um, the the great talent and capability that South Africans have working here and abroad. So I think in terms of our human capital, we're very fortunate and blessed. There's a there's a richness to that. Perhaps it's not uh, spread adequately, but we definitely have the the skills and capability to move the country forward. And I think it's about all of us working more together and for all the various initiatives uh, to be more joined up so that we can have greater impact. The pandemic has obviously had a devastating impact in certain industries, but I think we can see that there is a commitment to being able to put in place um, um, financial support. Unfortunately, you know, as we know, some people have uh, um, marred those efforts. Um, but if you look at, for example, the government accessing facilities from the World Bank quite speedily, um, accessing facilities from the BRICS Bank quite speedily, um, and being able to um, provide social support and social grants quite quickly in terms of uh, the technology that has been utilized. So there's 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 a lot of goodwill that you can see is coming, um, and and if we can capitalize on that and move the economy forward, I'm I'm very hopeful that we'll come out stronger for it. Sonia, I'd also imagine that uh, although you work within a lot of corporate systems, there is, a, I sense, an entrepreneurial spirit to you, as there has been to all of the guests that we've had on this particular show. Uh, and it, it's, it's almost part of the South African DNA, making things happen, getting things done. Uh, is that a space that you identify with and one that, the, that you feel stands South Africa in good stead? Oh, yes, definitely, uh, Dan. And in actual fact, to your point about, you know, what do we have to be, what reason do we have to be optimistic about the future? Uh, besides our, our skills and capabilities that we've spoken about, which I appreciated all over the world, I have great admiration for South African entrepreneurs who have built great businesses, are innovative and world leaders in their spheres and are so committed to South Africa and so committed uh, to developing this country. I mean, I think about some of the guests that you've had. You mentioned Michael Jordan before. Um, I think of the likes of an Adrian Gore. We have um, great entrepreneurial capability here. Elon Musk is a, is a perfect example of that. Um, and so to my mind, that really bodes well for the future. And that is the perfect note on which to sadly have to say goodbye to you, Sonia. It's been a great food, but even better company and really optimistic, not just hearing your own fantastic story, which casts you as such a role model as a successful black business person on her own terms, but also giving us reasons to believe in South Africa's future and perhaps be a little happier than we've been of late. So thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. It's been a, a lovely, lovely session with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for having me on your show, Dan. It's been an excellent experience. I've really enjoyed it. I um, appreciate the team. Wishing you and your family a wonderful weekend. And a weekend which I shall launch into with a spring in my step and some fabulous food in my belly. This has been Business Unknown, made just for you by Brightrock. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you to Sonia Debrain for telling us not just her story, but also giving us reasons to look ahead and to do so a little more positively than perhaps we have been of late. We'll be back again next Friday with another terrific example, another terrific guest who's done such wonderful things in South Africa. And if you've missed some of our earlier ones that are available on the Bright Rock platforms or you can get them at biznews.com. Thank you so much for joining me. I'm Dan Nichols. See you again next week. Goodbye.